totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll on! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Subscribe and give the podcast a five-star review wherever you listen. The website, bookedonrock.com. Photographer David Molnar is our guest to talk about his brand new book, Learning to See, a photographer's guide from zero to your first paid gigs. Whether you want to take better photos in your everyday life or make a full-time income as a photographer, maybe even working in the music business, shooting concerts and album covers, the five-part framework that David teaches in Learning to See will work for you. This book teaches readers to learn to see, because in the end, that's what a photographer does. Notice what other people often miss, and understand how to capture those things in a masterful way. David Molnar is a celebrity and advertising photographer, believer, and family man. His work has been seen on millions of Pepsi cans, in People magazine, on American Idol, and in the New York Times. His clients include Google, Pepsi, and Sony, among many others. He's photographed many artists and bands, including Skillet. David shot the album cover for the band's 2009 album, Awake, which he talks about in this interview. A link to see the album cover is in the show notes page, along with some music from Skillet and Switchfoot, another band David has worked with. David talks about that and a whole lot more in this interview. So let's get to it. Here is David Molnar. David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Eric. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we've heard the phrase before, when the universe calls, you need to listen. And your career changing <laughs> and your life changing moment came when you were 18. You were not planning on becoming a photographer. Can you talk yeah. about what happened that changed your career and your life course? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was on my way to be a professional airline pilot. I got my pilot's license when I was 18. You know, I really, st I studied for it between, uh, my junior year and senior year of high school. And I was going to use wrestling as a means to get out of the small town and get a, you know, get college, get university paid for, um, and kind of pursue that route. But then on Christmas Eve, you know, I was driving about an hour and a half away to the nearest mall. Cause there's no shopping on the Island pretty much where I grew up. And I got in a car accident at 60 miles per hour. And at that moment, everything changed in my life. I, uh, I would no longer wrestle. I would never wrestle again. I was undefeated at that point. And the guy, I, I had to sit and watch the guys that I had previously beaten um, win the state championship, you know, and I'm watching from a wheelchair. So that was a pretty, pretty dark and depressing time in my life. But enter in photography. I loved photography in high school, but I never thought of it as a viable career path. But after, you know, I had this a lot of time in physical therapy and a lot of time on my hands to think and ponder, I started thinking about becoming a professional photographer at that point. You have a photo in the book too of you and your dad in the hospital Christmas Eve 2002. Man, that is Yeah. Yeah, that that's that certainly is a moment that can be the wake of call and in your book, you write about how you dreamt of shooting album covers for bands that millions of people would yeah. see. And that dream comes true after years of hard work. Yeah, it, you know, it certainly certainly wasn't an easy overnight success by any means. But, you know, there's there's this moment when I was 19. So it's about a year after the car crash. I decided to take a year off between, you know, high school and college. And I went to volunteer at a nonprofit um, and this nonprofit worked with a bunch of bands. So I got to like, you know, shoot some bands, you know, for fun and for practice, like on at some of the concerts and the youth events that this nonprofit would put on. But I wanted to photograph my favorite band. You know, I'm a kid borrowing a camera from the nonprofit at this point. So just just to be clear, but I practiced. I took photography classes in high school and I started to get a little bit more serious about my craft. And I, I came up with this like kind of audacious idea to photograph my favorite band, which is a band called Switchfoot. Um, they're still around, but at the time that was like really, um, I don't know, they, they, they had this new album that came out called the beautiful letdown. And, you know, it's like this song where it's like, we were meant to live. I can't sing, but for so much more, <laughs> it inspired me so much. It, uh, it was, I mean, you know, music was everything to me. Music was music and photography were my therapy after my car crash. 
you know, I grew up going, you know, to rock concerts and, you know, one of my favorite things to do was go to the mosh pits and like, you know, just get as rowdy as possible, you know, as a teenager, couldn't do that so much after, uh, after my car accident. Cause I kind of had to learn how to walk again and see, bend my knees again. And so that was, uh, not a fun time of life, but you know, I had this dream to photograph my favorite band and I just wanted to do it for free. I wanted to give, give them the pictures. I didn't even believe that I was a real photographer at this point. So I was asking around like, Hey, does anyone have any contacts, you know, at this nonprofit that did work in the music industry? Um, I was like, does anyone have any contacts with Switchfoot? Everyone's like, no, 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 no one could get me access. But then one of my friends had mentioned like, Hey, I don't have any, you know, access to the band, but my, my boss does. And I'm like, remember like, Oh, your boss is that like beautiful older woman, you know, like that. I like kind of fumbled and stuttered a little bit in the hallway when I had met her for the first time. Her name was Tammy. And I was like, um, and I just remember thinking like, ah, I'm kind of nervous for you to ask her. It's like that pretty girl in high school that you're nervous to talk to. It was like those moments. And I'm like 19 years old. So, you know, you know, just like two or three years ago when I was 19 years old, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but anyways, she, she asked her boss, Tammy, if, if she could by any chance connect me with the band and get me into the backstage to the concert so I could photograph them. And this is nerve wracking. This is a big ask for me, you know, like we only have so much social equity with people, you know, and like, and I'm asking a friend of a friend to like stick their neck out for me and like talk to famous people and get me access to, um, you know, something that's, you know, kind of, kind of a big ask, right? It's a long shot. So, so it, it was a long shot. It was. And I don't know why, but for some reason, this beautiful girl named Tammy um, agreed like looked at my photos and I guess didn't think I was a fraud, even though I was very nervous. I'm like, I'm like, Oh, I should probably update my photos really quick. It's like what every photographer says, like, well, don't look at my site yet. Cause I'm about to update it. <laughs> you know, It's like every photographer says that or musicians like, well, check out our new songs. But anyways, um, I drove, I borrowed my sister's car, which almost broke down. And I drove like, I forget how many hours, five, five or six hours to San Antonio, Texas. And, um, and we got to the concert, yeah. a couple of friends and I, and I went to the to the will call booth to like say, hey, my name, you know, I should have a ticket on the, you know, on the thing, or whatever. And she looked and she looked and she looked and then she looked up at me and said, like, sorry, can't find your name on the list. And I'm like, can you look again? And she looks again and she's like, you know, frowning and being like, sorry, I can't find your name on the list. And I'm like, I'm like devastated. This is what I'm thinking at this point, Eric. I'm thinking. I. I know I'm a fraud. I know I'm a fake. And now the band has looked at my website and says, oh, this guy sucks. Like, there's no way we're letting him in backstage. There's no way we're letting him shoot our concert because he's just a kid borrowing a camera from, you know, the nonprofit and pretending to be a photographer. That's what I felt like in my soul at this moment, you know? And so there's all sorts of things to push through. And I think there's some life lessons to learn here, regardless of whether you're interested in music or photography, but you have to do things that scare you in order to achieve great things. And this was a moment in my life that I was freaking scared. I don't know why, but it was just this anxiety ridden, nerve wracking thing. I had told all my friends, my family, um, and all these people that I was going to photograph Switchfoot. And now I was going to be embarrassed because, because they found out I'm a fraud. That's what I'm feeling like, feeling like this imposter. I got Tammy's number, the one that connected me with the band originally. And I like reluctantly called her and I'm like nervous to talk to her because she's like this beautiful older, early, older girl. And by the way, I've heard these stories about how, how all the lead singers in the bands try to date her and she turns them all down. <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm just like nervous to like talk to this girl. A little okay? intimidating. Um, yeah. It was intimidating because she was kind of powerful. She had the power to, to book a band and put them in front of 50,000 people at one time. You know, so it was like she she had power and clout, you know, uh, in this organization and in the music industry. And anyways, I called her. She's gracious. And she, you know, she picked up she picked up the phone and I told her I was like frantically. I'm like, my name's not on the list, you know, and I wanted to say they found out I'm a fake. I'm a fraud. Um, I'm just a kid with a camera, you know, but she was like, hey, you know what? Shoulders back. Act like you're supposed to be there. Hold the phone up to your stay on the phone with me pretend like you're supposed to be there. Not like, not like fake it, but she's like, just act like you're supposed to be there. I'm like, okay, don't act confident or like a super fan or something like that. And she's like, and walk around to the back, 
you know, walk around to the back, you know, the backstage. Sometimes your name's not on the list at the front. Sometimes it's only on a list in the back. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, like, I guess I can do that. But I'm just thinking like, gosh, I don't want to like get rejected again, you know, and embarrassed everyone. So I take this long walk to the backstage. And then she's like, act like you're important. And I want you to walk up to the security guard or whoever's, whoever's like, you know, guarding the back door and tell them you're David Molnar, the photographer. And I'm just like oh. feeling suffocatingly like nervous. And Your anxious. heart's like pounding away. It's it's pounding, you know, and and I'm just kind of like, I'm not a photographer. I'm just this kid. I'm like trying to learn. I'm like, I'm just trying to give them some pictures. Like that's what I perceive myself to be at that moment. And she's like, no, you need to act confident and you need to tell them you're David Molnar, the photographer. So I like walk up and I feel like life was moving in slow motion. There's a 300 pound like UFC fighter, like guarding the back door. Um, I love UFC, by the way. Um, <laughs> but anyways, at that time, I didn't know what it was. So not back then. But I walk up to the door and like I mustered all the strength and all the courage that I could. And I said, I'm David Molnar, the photographer. And he looks down at his paper. and I'm like blacking out. I don't really like remember what happened really. Other, I don't know if he found my name in the list or if like if this false like confidence bravado like worked. But he opened the door and let me in. And I'm like, holy crap. You know, like this is, you know, this is incredible. And he just walks me up the stairs and then opens the door and ushers me right into the dressing room where, you know, my favorite band was just sitting around like jamming in the room, just, you know, like sitting backstage, like having, you know, having a drink, eating some snacks and just prepping to go on stage. And I'm just like, holy crap, you know, and I did play it kind of cool, but they're like, they were super nice. And they were like, how are you, you know, how are you doing? What's your name? What are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I'm just, here. you know, I don't even think they knew that I was supposed to be there, but they were like, cool, you know, whatever. Uh, they're very chill guys, at least from what I remember, I haven't talked to them since, but they were just very casual, very nice. And I was like, I'm just going to give you guys these pictures. So what was crazy is, you know, I poured my heart into photographing that show backstage and on stage. And it was really fun. I was having the time of my life. And I had, you know, I felt I may have felt like a fraud, like a fake. And I think a lot of us, like as we're building towards our career or profession or dreams, like we feel like we don't know if we have what it takes, you know, and in photography and music, there is no bar exam to tell you you've arrived. There's no one to officially say, like, you've graduated, you're ready to play in front of 50,000 people or you're ready to be a professional photographer. It's hard in artistic industries to get. Um, you know, to get that validation and to know that you're ready. Okay. So this is what I was struggling with. And I imagine many aspiring would be musicians and rock stars, and artists in general would, would feel the same thing. But I had told them, I'm going to give you guys these pictures for free. And they're like, okay, cool, man. So I burned the pictures to my CD and the CD drive failed like three or four times in the process. <laughs> but uh, if you guys don't know what a CD drive is, you might have to Google that. But I sent the photos to their manager, you know, like a week later or whatever it was. And they they emailed me back or I forget, I guess it was email at the time. And they said, we want to buy buy this photo. We love there's a specific photo of the guys rocking out on stage. We want to buy this photo from you for um, 200 bucks. And we want to put it on the, the beautiful letdown world tour T-shirt for Switchfoot. And I'm just like you know, this crazy moment. And then they, they also said, and we also want to pay you another 200 bucks and put this, um, put the same photo inside the next album, not like the album cover, but like a picture inside the sleeve of the, um, of the album. What a rush. And it was just, oh my gosh. It was like, I mean, I was on the, t I felt like I won the lottery. I'm like, my favorite band likes my pictures and they're going to pay me money. And I told them I'd give it to them for free. You know, like it was just like, I, I felt like, I felt like I was in the top of the world, but what was interesting through that whole thing, um, you know, cause it was an amazing early success um, for me uh, followed by years of struggle after that. And we can get to that. Okay. Yeah. But like, this was just kind of a glimpse into the future of what, you know, what I could become. And it was an encouraging moment, you know, for musicians, it might be an open mic night where you get like a round of like crazy applause. And then you work your butt off for years, you know, to try to get that record deal. You know what I mean? There's a lot of heartache in between, but this was that moment of early success. But what was interesting is there was a defining moment where I became a photographer during that interaction with my favorite band. And it wasn't it wasn't the moment that the band said they liked my photos. 
It wasn't the moment where they paid me to put the photo on the t-shirt. It wasn't the moment where they paid me to put the photo in the album. It was the moment that I proclaimed to the universe and to myself that I was a photographer. That was the distinction. That was the line in the sand that I drew that I stepped across and I never went back. And that's an important thing where you have to, you have to essentially own it. You have to project it to the world that you are a musician, you are an artist, you are a photographer, whatever it is that your craft is, because only you can define when you're ready. Now, that doesn't mean you've arrived. That doesn't mean that you have learned everything you need to know, but it means that you are becoming, you know, the person that you've dreamt about and you proclaim that you are. And when you do that, people will hitch their wagons to you. Because if you don't, if you're like, yeah, I'm kind of like taking pictures sometimes, no one wants to recommend you if you're half halfway confident about it. If you're confident and you portray like, this is who I am and this is where I'm going, people are like, man, like when they think of someone who needs a photographer, I, they think of David Molnar because everyone and their mom knew that I was a photographer after that point. Yeah. I proclaimed it to the world. Seeing starts with you. That's in your book, right? Seeing starts yeah. with you. If you don't see yourself as what you want to become, it won't happen. That's really important. And the job of a photographer, you say, is not just to take a snapshot of a moment. It's to craft a story. People need to That's read right. the book to really get the full understanding of this. But can you give a, a brief run through of what the five steps to masterful storytelling are? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a great um great question. Um, you know, like I've like I've talked about in the book, snap like p great photos aren't aren't snapped. They're not just like a snap. They're um or a you know quick snapshot. They're actually made. They're actually crafted. Okay, and there's all sorts of things that go into telling a story. But I, I talk about five specific steps that anyone can use to take a better photo, whether or not they're using an iPhone or they're using a you know ten thousand dollar camera, um you know package. But the steps are number one is to document the fleeting moment because you know the the baby's laughter might stop, the sunset the sunset might disappear, the bird might fly away, you know, the rock concert would end, or they walk to the other side of the stage, you know, and then the lighting changes because you know God knows that the strobes are changing all the time. You have to document the fleeting moment and capture the story. It's so important to preserve that moment, and then. Step two is to identify what is essential in your story, all right? Meaning, what are the essential characters and subjects and objects in the story? I use this illustration of um, in the book, and you know, obviously, this is all voice, so we can't show the picture. But I use this illustration of the moment that my grand, that, well, that my dad was teaching my son how to fish. So grandfather teaches his son how to fish, and. There, I took a snapshot, like right when they, when my grand, or when my son, sorry, his grandson caught the fish for the first time, but the fish was super small. It was like three inches or something. And it was so far away. It was so hard to see. And I couldn't see their expressions because I was like to the side or something. And, um, and it's like, the story is like, I preserved the moment, but the fish looks so small. I'd have to point out that it's even there. All right. And then, so, but you know what you document the fleeting moment check okay then identify what's important well the grandfather the grandson and the fish are the three things that are important all the distracting boats and all the distracting like clutter and trees and stuff in the background are not what's important to the story of grandfather teaches his son to fish okay the water isn't even necessarily important right the grandfather the son and the fish are the things that are the most important and the expressions of joy in their face so then step three is to remove distractions. So whether you're at a rock concert and you're standing in front of a dumpster, um, you know, like you want to like sidestep or get around that dumpster that's on the side stage or whatever, so that that distraction is not in front of you. Okay. And in my case, with um, you know, with my uh, dad and son, I wanted to like kind of zoom in on them, get a little bit closer to the action. And like have the fish maybe in the forefront so that it looked, you know, larger and more prominent. And then I can kind of essentially focus in on just what's important. And so in the final image, um, it shows the fish like right in front of the camera. So it makes it kind of like look a lot bigger, a little white lie, because whatever is closest to the camera will look bigger. And then um, and then it has my my son, you know, smiling and my dad kind of like looking on proudly. I was going to say, yeah, look at your dad. He's got that look of pride. Yeah. And that's like that's like the story that I wanted to tell. 
was you know just those three those three objects or the th the two subjects and the the object of their attention you know because that just tells a better more powerful story but the fourth step is to find beautiful light you know and that that's a really important thing and lighting can can really affect you know how your your image feels in the end and it'd be a little tricky to talk about lighting on you know an audio podcast but um you know it's important to pay attention to what the light's doing and try to find good light that helps tell your story and then the fourth step is to compose this story to actually you know use use all of these tricks and stuff that I actually talk about in the following chapter of the book to mm -hmm. to tell a good story you know to to actually eliminate those distractions and compose an interesting story where it draws um, your viewer's eyes right to the subject. Yeah, it's why those are the five steps. People need to buy the book to see the photos. I'm looking at them right here. Some beautiful shots mm -hmm. too. And I want to ask you about some more as we go along too. You've got a great website people need to check out as well. DavidMolnar.com. M-O-L-N-A-R. You have a blog and a recent post is about how to photograph a concert. Having the right gear and strong technical skills are a must, and this is due to the challenges you will face shooting a concert. What makes shooting a concert so challenging? Oh, the lighting is usually low. And for photography, you know, it's it's tricky lighting. That's the that's the tricky part. To in order to great to get great shots of a concert, you really need to learn how to control your camera in manual exposure mode. I'm not talking about manual focus. I'm talking about like actually controlling how your camera is recording light with um three specific things, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. They're all things that you can control manually to control, you know, uh, whether movement is showing in your shot. A lot of people say, I get blurry images. I need a, I have a bad camera. I need a new camera. I'm like, no, you need to learn how to use the camera you have so that you can get tack sharp images because anyone can do it with any type of camera. Um, but that's the tricky part about concerts um, specifically, or just the technical side of of shooting in low light, because it's a dark situation, and then there's bright spots, there's bright strobes and flashing lights, and you know beams of light, and that's the type of stuff that yeah, gets really tricky, and you need to get comfortable shooting your camera and changing settings really fast um, in order to do that. Uh, but then the next thing is like just anticipating the movement, you know, of the concert. And there's a lot of um, yeah. movement. That's a thing. A lot of movement. So you're taking, I'm sure, a ton of photos to make sure you get the right, capture the right moment. Oh, yeah. We hear a lot today about how camera phones are as good as any camera. But you say when it comes to shooting concerts, not so. Yeah. Um, you know, I am a Canon shooter. But, um, you know, as you, as you can see, but your viewers can't see, I have a Nikon and also a Sony on my desk as well. So I, I love them all. I think they're great. You know, Fuji makes great cameras. So um, it, it really doesn't matter what brand you choose. At the end of the day, what's most important is that you not get into a ton of debt to buy camera gear. You know, number one, buy something that you can afford that makes sense to you. Um, I think the thousand dollar camera, which is still expensive, but it's less expensive than my five thousand dollar camera. You know, uh, there's a thousand dollar Canon camera called the Canon RP, and it's a couple years old now, so they may come out with a new version of that soon. But it's phenomenal. I just that's the camera I just bought for my wife. She loves taking pictures, and it's just it's just an incredible camera that shoots incredible in low light, be an incredible concert uh, camera. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really phenomenal. iPhones are awesome. I get my new iPhone 14 Pro in in a couple of days, um, which, you know, they just up the cameras on that. Um, I haven't really shot with Android, so I can't speak to that, but I know people like their cameras as well. Um, at the end of the day, um, smartphone cameras are awesome for capturing everyday life. And you could take some good concert photos with smartphones for sure. But no one is showing up to, a professional shoot where like I sh I've shot a lot of photos for a band called skillet and um, and you know they they would hire me a bunch of times to go and photograph their concerts I was not showing up with an iPhone to photograph their concerts you know like I was using all the skills and knowledge that I had you know earned over the years and using my real professional Canon camera gear and lenses to photograph those concerts and also no flash, right? You may be tempted to reach for your flash, but you say, don't do it. I don't use a flash in concert. The flash that pops up on inexpensive cameras, like they're not even on professional, like more expensive cameras. Like there's no flash that pops up on a camera that's over a thousand bucks. Don't quote me on that, but 
approximately like this $2,500 camera that I'm holding doesn't have a flash on it. You know, the only thing you could get is an external flash, um, like what's called speed lights, but I don't recommend that for concerts. You want to capture the natural ambience and vibe of that concert. And the settings can be tricky. Um, if you do a flash, you're just, it's kind of distracting, you know, like when you're shooting weddings or concerts or anything like that, like I would never use a flash. And I know a wedding is a lot different than a rock concert, but it's like, you're you're disrupting a sacred moment and a rock concert is a sacred moment you know like you're there to soak it up you know don't be a distraction plus the photos will look like crap too in my opinion the booked on rock podcast will return after this the booked on rock podcast is on facebook twitter and instagram find us on facebook at facebook.com slash booked on rock podcast on twitter at booked on rock and on instagram at booked on rock podcast what are some of your favorite concert photography moments? Is there a particular photo that really stands out to you? Like, yeah, that is my best right there. Yeah, there's, um, so I photographed a lot of concerts, you know, like the Switchfoot concert was like the most significant at that point in my 19 year old, my 19 year journey. But really there was, um, so the band Skillet, they're a, a rock band. They're in the Christian music industry and they're a crossover band. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them or not, but they, yep. um, they, uh, great, great crew. I love them to death. That photographing their concerts and their album cover changed my life because the, like I was talking about the struggle between having that early success with Switchfoot and then like the years of hard work in before I started getting album cover shoots. You know, because photographing a concert and like kind of getting lucky, getting a good picture. And I, I didn't get lucky, but I sort of got lucky a little bit. You know, um, that's a lot different than a record label saying, hey, here's forty thousand dollars. Do an album cover shoot. You know, we're trusting you and putting the hands. You know, we're, we're putting our multimillion dollar investment of this album in your hands to create imagery to market it. That's a big dis difference. There's a big distinction there, okay? So the the David Molnar that photographed a concert as a 19-year-old kid, um, and then the David Molnar that earned the privilege of photographing Skillet's album cover like six or seven years later was two completely different photographers with vastly different experiences, you know? And I know you specifically asked about like what concert impacted me, but there was a moment where... I I mean, I, you know, I've been working my butt off after Switchfoot 19. And then I don't think I shot the the skillet album cover till I was like maybe 27 or something like that. Like there's like eight years, seven or eight years in between where I was working my butt off doing, you know, shooting concerts, shooting um, like album covers for like any indie artist that I could beg to let me do a free shoot for them, you know, and then eventually I started getting paid to do some, you know, some lower budget indie artists. And then so a very small record label maybe you know, gave me a chance for like a $500 gig. And then, you know, my wife, uh, oh, I didn't mention this earlier. I meant to remember that beautiful girl, Tammy, that I was telling you about. Yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. this. I, I like, know the end I, of this story. I, yeah. Yeah. I tell, I tell the story in the book, but, um, I ended up marrying her. I met my wife, Tammy from that, you know, tr photographing the Swift Short concert. So it was like, it was like this, uh, this really cool moment. Oh, cool. She went that? on to, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it still is pretty awesome. Four kids you later. You got a beautiful know. family. There's a picture of you and your family in the in the book. What a life. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's it's a very full life right now. We're very blessed. I can't, I can't believe she's still putting up with me 16 years <laughs> later. You grew up in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Yeah. Beautiful area, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's stunning. I love it. Moved to the panhandle of Florida now, but we spent 14 years in Nashville. So my wife... Um, moved to Nashville, took a job with the management of the band Skillet, actually. So she was she was on the management team for Skillet and a couple other bands. And it was like one of those things where I'm like, yeah, maybe I can photograph Skillet, you know? And it's like, I she was working for the company for like five or six years and I knew the band and they they wouldn't give me the opportunity to photograph them. I had to earn it. I was going and doing all sorts of other shoots and all sorts of things, proving myself. And then they didn't just give me the album cover opportunity. Okay. They were like, Hey, we have a new band member. We just need a quick press shot so that we can print on eight, eight by tens because this awesome British girl named Jen joined the band to be their new drummer. And 
they're like, we need a, a new photo that represents it. But our album cover photo shoot isn't for another six months. So we need a temporary photo. They're like, maybe we can give David an opportunity now that we've known him for five or six years to like to photograph this and we'll see how he does, you know? So it was a low pressure like opportunity that it's like, well, if it doesn't work out, no problem. We'll get the real album cover shoot with a real photographer in a few months yeah. from now. You know, now we, I mean? we should make this um, is the 09 album cover awake. This is for that album. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Awake. If yeah. anybody's interested, look it up. It's, it's an amazing shot. It's a photo of a person with their head covered like a mummy with one eye shown. What do you remember about taking that shot and who is it we see on the cover? If there's a story behind that. Well, well, first of all, the, the press photo that gave me this opportunity to do this, this press photo for them. And I flew to like Oklahoma and did this shot at one of the venues they were playing at and probably shot the concert that evening. And they loved the photo and they're like, okay, great. You've proven to us that you can do it. And we're going to give you a shot to shoot the album cover. And then that, and then enter in the album cover for a week, you know, and they, they gave me the opportunity um, to do it. And I was just like, I poured my heart and soul into it. And then, you know, they had this concept for, you know, awake where it does look like it's a mummy. It was, um, it was funny because it was John Cooper is the lead singer. So we wrapped him in this gauze and, um, it was a two day shoot. So the first day was to shoot the album cover. The second day was to shoot all the press photos. And we wrapped John in this gauze and we took a bunch of photos and we took all, like all these side views. There's some other like B side versions of the album where we have him from other angles and stuff like that. Um, and it was just super fun. So as John Cooper, the lead singer is actually the person in the picture, but I think they took, I think we ended up taking Ben Cassica, who was the former guitar player at the time. I think we ended up taking his eyeball and replacing it with John's eyeball. Cause oh. like John's eyeball looked, John's eyeball, I think was too dark in the image I think he had like dark brown eyes, if I remember correctly. And uh, Ben had blue eyes and they just swapped the one eye out. Yeah. It's kind of funny, but <laughs> but it, it, it just kind of like felt more like friendly. Like we didn't want it to be like too scary, but we wanted to convey like someone's like waking up in a hospital. Right. I think there's a music video where, where well, it's like that too. Whose idea was that for that image? The concept? And yeah. All that? Was that yours? Did you? Gosh, man, this was like 13, 14 years ago at this point. I, I just remember having, you know, conversations with the band manager, with John, with the art director, um, Mark from Atlantic Records. And that's what we came up with. I, I, I'm I not going to take credit for it. I, I don't remember. I don't remember, honestly, because yeah. so many creative conversations are like this sparring thing where you're like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And then here's half the idea. And then you're like, oh, I want to add this to it, too. And then well, and then it becomes like a collaboration of an it's idea. It's thought provoking. You know? It's like, is this person yeah. coming out of a a coma in the sense are they is there mm -hmm. an awakening in their life and they're now coming out of it and the eye comes out and say okay i'm starting to see it's it's you can look at it and try to make of it what whatever you interpret it as which is what great art is it's it's a, you know all in the eye of the beholder say oh i know what that means and then somebody else says no yeah. i don't think it means that i think he's yeah it's 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 a, it's it's perfect thank you yeah that was a that was a momentous occasion. It, it was interesting because that, um, you know, keep in mind, I'd been working my butt off for a decade at this point or nearly a decade, you know, like trying to be pro. And, it, you know, I photographed Skillet at this point and this was my first big break. And it was like, you know, I had spent years assisting other photographers, carrying sandbags, setting up light stands, setting up lights, setting up backgrounds, you know, getting the record label execs coffee, you know, because I'm the little guy cleaning the toilets, you know, like sweeping the studio afterwards. Like that's what I did for years after I had that switch foot success. Another lesson okay? learned. Yeah. Do whatever. Yeah. You like I worked do. my butt off for years. And it's like all these record label, you know, people don't remember me as the little assistant that no one even pays attention to. But all of a sudden, when I photographed Skillet, and then that album went on to sell 2 million freaking records, all of a sudden, the Nashville music scene knew my name. And my phones are ringing off the hook to photograph band after band after band. And and it was funny because I'm like reintroducing myself to people I used to get coffee for and being like, man, I cleaned the toilet after you. <laughs> like it was gross. Yeah, well, you know what I mean? Like it's like it's crazy and they don't remember it. And I don't I don't like shame them for it, you know, um, for not remembering me as the little assistant. But it's just funny how it like came back around. And and I, I didn't want to be like, yeah, you met me when I was an assistant. Like I just kind of like I just reintroduced myself as if I was arriving for the first time, you know, to not embarrass them or anything. But so here's my question now to you. So you get to that point now the calls are coming in so that can become overwhelming it's great 
a yeah. lot of interest. But now you're trying to juggle, like schedule wise. You got it now. You got to mm-hmm. learn how to say I get I say no to some, I guess, or I can't do it now. I could do. It. How do you handle all that? Do you need help now? Do you have to bring people in to say I can't do this all on my own? I I gotta I gotta keep all this stuff organized. Yeah, uh, eventually it was around that time, maybe a, a little bit after the Skillet um, album cover. Uh, my wife, Tammy, exited her job at the management company, and we're still like best friends with Zach and Velvet, who are the you know the owners of that management company, the PR firm. Um, so we love them to death. My wife gave them like a year's notice to transition out because she was so valuable to them. But she came on board to help me logistically with shoots. And, uh, and that made, that made a huge difference. And now I have a whole team of people, but that was, you know, at, you know, we're talking about 10, 10 years ago, whenever she transitioned out of her day job. Well, the other question I want to ask too, for those who are listening again, who want to get into this business, making ends meet until you've made it to that point where you can make a living doing what you love. What do you do to make ends meet in those early days? Man, I did a lot. I was a hustler. Like I was trying to build websites. I was building flash websites. I don't know if you remember flash back in the day. It's like banned on like computers now. Apple won't allow it. I was making flash websites. I was doing, I shot weddings for, you know, for years while I was trying to work my way up to shoot album covers. I did all sorts of things, you know, to try to, to try to make my way. Now, a lot of people can have, you know, a successful career doing, you know, I, I would say like a normal day job. And then work their way up to being a you know a, a professional photographer, a photographer, so they can replace their income. Um, but that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I dabbled in some other entrepreneurial endeavors, but ultimately, I was trying to pursue photography the whole time and trying to make a living in photography, even if it wasn't um, the type of photography that I ultimately wanted to do. So for a while, I photographed weddings, and I. I I didn't want to, you know, full disclosure, I, I didn't want to, but I felt like, I felt like a voice inside. Um, I felt like God was telling me to shoot weddings for a season of my life to earn income and provide for my family, you know? And then afterwards, um, I was able to transition. I had, we had paid off all of our debts from shooting weddings. We had, you know, put some money in the bank. My wife was able to like, you know, exit her job eventually, but then I was able to go full time into shooting commercial photography, which is what I really wanted to do and loved, yep. but I had to kind of earn it, you know, like doing a high end career. I don't mean to sound pretentious, but I mean like shooting album covers is hard and not many people can do it, you know, getting advertising gigs with like Google and uh, Pepsi and all these different companies. Like that's not like a thing that every photographer will get the opportunity to do. Okay. They're not going to allow a newbie or someone who just shoots, you know, newborn portraits to do that. No offense to, you know, anyone who shoots maternity portraits or something. But you have to kind of work your way up. And so what I recommend to new photographers, and we talk about this in chapter nine of the book, uh, and developing the specialty of your choice, is you need to find, if you want to make money, now not everyone wa- wants to make money. Some people want to do photography just for passion. They want to do it for therapy. They want to do it for fun. It's a hobby. And that's great. Half of my photography students just love taking pictures of landscapes and wildlife for fun. Awesome. So noble, so worthy, so incredible. Some people like shooting concerts just for fun. Awesome. You know, but if they want to actually pursue photography and make a career out of it, then you need to find a viable, marketable path to make money in. Okay. And there are certain photography paths that are more reasonable or more realistic to make a living in. So there's this guy who wrote this book called um, Business Brilliant. Lewis Schiff wrote this book. And he said this, he takes all these like ideas that we'll we'll call it middle-class Americans, like we'll say out loud, like these sayings, like do what you love and the money will follow, right? And he takes these phrases and he terms, he flips them upside down and he's like, false, that's not true. He's like, but here's what is true. Um, Because there's lots of times where, you know, doing what you love won't reap money, you know? And photography, I use the, the quirky example of if you want to photograph tattooed whales that live in Alaska or Antarctica, like you're going to have a hard time like getting them to pay you money because even if you love photographing tattooed whales, which doesn't exist to my knowledge, but like, you know, like it's a, such an obscure thing. Like how could money follow? I don't know. Maybe there's a way, but if, and if you do that, then let me know. But the point is, is that's not necessarily a viable career option that's been a proven path 
Okay. But something like wedding photography, headshot photography, real estate photography, um, you know, food photography, portrait photography, family portraits, et cetera. Those are viable paths that are proven and realistic to make a living in. Okay. And to work your way up. So something that was maybe more niche, like album cover photography was something I had to work my way up to. In the meantime, I chose a viable proven path like wedding photography that I knew I could make money in to get good, build reserves, um, you know, get established and then build my niche portfolio of shooting album covers, you know? Interesting, so, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. So what Lewis Schiff said in that book is do what you love but always, always, always follow the money. And it, it shouldn't be like sell your soul. That's not what he's saying. But for instance, if you love landscape photography as an illustration, landscape photography is, is kind of like the, uh, it's a hard way to make a living. Because you know a lot of people, everyone loves landscape, taking landscape photos, but who buys them? Mountains don't buy them. You know, like the mountain can't pay you. People have to pay you and they have to want to take, to buy that specific picture. So, um, you know, I really like you could take all the skills that you use in landscape photography and you could shoot landscapes with a house in it and call it real estate photography. And then there's lots of people, realtors and homeowners that will pay you really good money to use those same skills that you use in real estate, sorry, in landscape photography, but apply it to a viable marketable career path like real estate photography. Then you can build your portfolio on the side of landscape photography and maybe become the anomaly that makes $400,000 a year selling their landscape prints. Because I know people that do that. They're just rare. You yeah. Know? So it's, yeah, work hard, but work smart. And that's, yes. that's the thing. Yeah. Well, who are your favorite rock photographers? Do you have any classic rock album covers that really stand out to you that you just say, man, that's that's the style. That's I love that guy or that woman, that how, how they do it. It's a great question. There's some great, you know, um, of course, from the 60s and 70s, man. There's some, so there's some ones that are brilliantly simplistic, like Dark Side of the Moon, Storm Thorgerson, and Hypnosis, that company and yeah. the work they did. Anything that stands out? Oh man, like I, so I just gotten, I just got a record player again. My record player broke like 15 years ago. And I just bought a new one, and I've been like collecting records. And um, you know, like one of the the first record that I ever bought was a record that I listened to every day. And it maybe, you know, maybe it's just on my phone um, over the Sonos speakers, but um, it, it's this record. Let me see if I can pull it out. This is my favorite record of all time. And I know that you guys oh, can't see it, but it's, yeah, Miles, it's Miles, Davis. Da Miles Davis kind of blue. And, I, you know, this is this is a I, I don't know the story behind this photograph. I should look it up. But, um, you know, this is just such a, this is the I've been listening to this album for like, you know, 20 years. Oh. And I, I mean. There's not many mornings that I skip. I, I like wake up to this album. You Brilliant know, like it's album. Like my sip, my sip and coffee album. And um, Freddie Freeloader is probably my favorite song, favorite jazz song of all time. But this, you know, this album cover has Miles Davis playing the trumpet. And I think, I think uh, it's probably from a live concert. And I don't know who photographed it. Um, I, I should, I'm going to find I out now. Let's it. see. You I, know, should, it, I should look it up. It's crazy though, David. I just interviewed and this episode just went up. The author, Robert Dimery, put a book out called Music Quakes about just the mo 50 moments throughout mm -hmm. music history that, you mm -hmm. know, just very influential moments uh, that kind of just disrupted things and were ahead of their time. And that's one of the albums. He, he talks about that album. Really? That's, yeah, that's one of the 50. And, you know, when I was prepping for the interview, I just popped on that album. And my dad loved that album. He's talked about it all the time. And man, it is yeah. just, yeah, you, you could just listen to it and it's it's timeless. And yeah, that photo, let's see, the the album cover for Kind of Blue, I'm sure we can do a a check on this and see who shot it. But you're right, it's probably a, a shot from when he's in a concert. Here's a, while you're waiting, here's a couple yeah. of my other favorites. Most recent favorite, um, I don't necessarily like the way he dresses, but it's kind of, cause it's kind of, it's not my style, but Harry Styles, um, this album cover right here where he, you know, he's standing in his, like his, his living room and he's like, he's standing on the ceiling. I don't know if you've seen yeah. that. But Which it's, album it's, is that? It's, it's, gosh, what is this one called? I'm like, it's, it's just whatever his most recent album is, isn't it? Well, I got, I got like here, Jay Mazel. Grape Juice has that song. Jay, oh, Grape Juice is on that album. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jay Mazel is the one who does the Miles Davis album cover. Uh, M-A-I-S-E-L is his name. And mm. I don't see it. I'm trying to find if there's a story behind it, but I'm sure there is. 
What about angle? Angle is super important. You say you made the mistake of shooting an album cover photo from a low angle. So this is one of those learning lessons. You know, you learn from your mistakes, right? A lesson you want to pass on is don't shoot from unflattering angles. What yeah. are com- what are common yeah. unflattering angles, and and how do you find a flattering angle? Well, um, you know, one of the biggest, easiest things to say is, especially if someone's not a skinny twig. All right, like for me. Um, like if I, if anyone shoots from a slightly lower angle, I look like I have seven chins, you know, (laughs) and, uh, I'm just kidding, but at least two or three chins. And, uh, so that's like one of the biggest things I talk about in the book is like, try not to shoot humans from a lower angle, you know, because if you do that, unless they're like doing a really intentional job of stretching their neck out enough to where they're not causing like, like turtle lines or something, but. Um, but also not like doubling up. That's one of the the most important things um, is to is to not do that. And then a couple other things like if you're if you're taking a selfie or if you're taking a group photo or anything like that, try to stay in the center because especially on iPhones and most cameras, like if you're on the edges, you're going to get stretched out and you're going to look thicker or wider than you actually are. So it's funny when whenever my wife gets in a group photo because she's doing like a girl's group photo, I feel like every other day she always tries to get in the center because it makes you look the best and the most flattering. So shoot from a little bit higher angle and then try to get in the center of the photo. Otherwise you'll get stretched out unnaturally. And there was what, there was a band that you had shot an album cover for and it, and it didn't yes. work out. And that was one you learned from, right? Well, they ended up using the, they ended up using the photos, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say who the band is. Right. They ended up using the photos and the press stuff, but then they, they didn't end up hiring me again. Cause I think, I think some of the band members didn't like how unflattering like that low angle was of them or like made their arms look thicker or something like right. that. But speaking of which, here's, here's one of my other favorite album covers of all time. Um, John Mayer, heavier things. I yes. just, it's in the studio. It's so simple. It's such a classic and I'm blanking on the photographer who shot this, but I remember assisting, I feel like his name was like Chapman Baylor or something. Don't quote me uh, on that. But like, I remember assisting the photographer Um, He like flew in from LA or something. And I assisted him for a day in Nashville when I was working my way up. And I remember thinking, you shot that cover. I love that cover. You know, like, yeah. um, And I I was trying to find out who shot it. Yeah. I mean, that's considered, uh, is that black and white? I mean, it's not. It's, it's not black and white, but it's like, it's kind of like a a, bluish. uh, Yeah. Bluish, almost like a sepia tone, but like, but with a bluish color instead of greenish. Well, because that, so, that's yeah. what I, I wanted to ask you about shooting for black and white. As you write, sometimes the absence of color can be powerful and color can sometimes be a distracting element. How do you know when it's yeah. best to go with black and white over color? Or is it it's just based on a feeling you get at that moment? Yeah. Cover photo, Chapman Baylor. That's right. There you okay, go. Okay, cool. I, fa- I found it on the, gotta found give it on the him, album. Got to give him props. Um, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times if an image is really busy or like distracting, meaning like the background is super distracting, Um, you can make it monotone or black and white and it can kind of help bring the attention in. And especially if the background is really busy or if there's lots of bright colors back there, you know, and you turn it black and white, then it can help take, take the attention back to your subject, but you don't shoot the image in black and white anymore. You know, back in the day when my dad gave me, I'm holding a 35 millimeter film camera from way back in the day that my dad, my first camera, I shot black and white, like uh, film, I forget Ilford HP five or something like that was the film. Um, and that was actually black and white. Like there's no way to make it color. It was, it was black and white film, but now you shoot a digital photo and you convert it to black and white after the fact. Like Ansel Adams is all black and white. Why do you think that was just something that that's just uh, each individual photographer just has their style and approach? Well, first of all, Ansel Adams was shooting back in the day when I believe probably, especially in his early years, there was only black and white film available to him. Like, I don't know if there was color even available, okay. um, but I imagine in his later years, I, I don't remember his, his, like his life timeline, but most of the, most of his work would have only had the option to be black and white, but he was a master at black and white and bringing out the important details. And, and, uh, you know, just, it was just incredible the work that he created. I'm going to scroll through your book here. I want to get to some of the great photos that you have in here and ask you about them. There's one of an artist underwater, but you can also see above the water. There there are lightning bolts coming down on the water. I don't know if it's in the book. I think you're talking about an album cover I shot for Colton Dixon. It's on your website. Yes. Yes. People need to go to your website. It's funny. I almost 
I almost put that photo in the book, but I didn't I didn't have a chance to ask permission from the record label in time before I put it in the book. Um, but um, yeah, that was a Colton Dixon was on American Idol. He was a he was like a I forget, like a top five finalist, but he went on to sign a, a record deal with 19 Records, who was the, is the company that puts on American Idol. Yeah, that was a really fun album cover. I actually shot that in a pool. Um, shot him underwater, which is really fun. He's a trooper. He's a good buddy of mine. And uh, and then we composited, meaning in Photoshop, we added the the wave and the lightning bolts and the other you know chaos above the water to kind of you know create the whole scene. I mean, it it was like eighteen hours in Photoshop. Oh, well, I can imagine because it looks almost like it's it's like um not it's almost like a cartoon type of feel to it it's an yeah. animated type of feel to it i love that shot that is so cool by the way i'll put Thank a link you. i'm going to put a link up on the show notes page so it can send people directly to that but also it's on your website david molnar.com but there, there was another yeah. one of a musician playing the guitar and he's in an open field and then the cable from the guitar is it looks like it's plugged into the sun yeah that was that was really fun um one of my favorite things about working with artists is a lot of times they're very creative and they have really cool ideas and i get to help those ideas come to life and uh that was a musician named hart steen um if i remember correctly and i shot that a long time ago like maybe 14 years ago wow. hart was was like one of the first indie artists that i shot um and he really cool guy he was uh he, you know, like it was one of my first, it was one of my first paid music gigs, you know, like I, I forget how much, but he, he paid me to photograph this album cover and he had this idea to like plug his cord into the sun and I had to like figure out how to make it happen. Um, and so that wasn't, you know, like it wasn't my idea per se to plug it into the sun. That was his idea. And I'm like, I love it. Let's do it. Yeah. You know? And so we had to figure out how to make it happen. It's so a really cool guy. Photoshop is fun then. You, it looks like you have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. And that shot was actually, you know, there's a little Photoshop. What we did is we actually took the cord and we, you know, had a long like light stand and we tied the cord to the end of the light stand and we like hoisted it up to where the like, you know, the cord was going right in front of the sun. And so it was actually there like in the sun. Oh, but then okay. what we did is we, we photographed, sorry, we Photoshopped out the light stand. So that way oh, wow. you couldn't see the light stand holding the cord up. There are so many on here people really need to check out. And, you know, there are a lot of these where you do a nice, simple shot. Maybe they're in a barn or something. And then there are others where you there's some really great effects after you take the shot. So it, you like to mm -hmm. mix it up and you have fun with these. And there are just so many here to look at. There's one of a guy in a studio. Let's see. What's this one? He's just hanging in his studio there. <laughs> He's got all of his equipment all around him. And then it looks like, yeah. Oh, yeah. His, his bandmates are, there's three bandmates. And it's got this effect, like I don't know what you would call it. You could, yeah, they're speak they're to that. they're like they're blurred. They're motion. Right. There's there's so much motion that they're blurred. Yeah, um, that was a that was a, one of my favorite producers named David Grow. He's based in Nashville. He has a company called Howling Music. He produces incredible records, and he um and he produces like a lot of music for TV and film and commercials really talented guy, good friend of mine. We've worked together a bunch over the years. And usually I was working with him to photograph an artist that he was producing because he's a producer. Um, but in this, in this case, he wanted to get a photo of him in the studio. And so, and he wanted to, he, he was like, I have this idea. I want to show all the chaos that happens right. in the studio. It has all the chords and like all the stuff. And yeah. it's this real high production. Xylophone like thing. in there. And he's got all the, he's got all the musicians jamming out and like rocking out. Um, it was really fun. That was I, that's one of my favorite pictures. I do love that photo. Yeah, awesome. So many to check out there, and uh, also we can find your podcast through your website. What's the podcast about? Um, the podcast is called Your Photography Mentor Podcast, and you know it's it's my my um, my partner in crime, Rich Coleman, who's my fellow photography mentor, and we just we just talk about photography. You know, like a lot of times. Um, we're just chit chatting, you know, at full disclosure, it's not always a photography tutorial. Sometimes we're just talking about recent events and stuff like that. Um, and sometimes it like, we get really into doing a photography tutorial. So yeah, it's just, it's just kind of a fun outlet for Rich and I to go up, go, go on air, make fun of each other, cut up a little yeah, bit. Yeah. It's, it's we always those, the greatest podcasts yeah. are ones where you just, it does, it, it's like the people on the podcast forget it's a podcast. They're just 
Yeah. Chilling and chatting. Just 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 having a conversation. <laughs> Chill and chat. Yeah. Learning to see a photographer's guide from zero to your first paid gigs. It's out today through Harper Horizon. It's available wherever books are sold. And there's also a very cool added feature of the book where people can get some very cool video lessons, right? For each chapter. That's right. Yeah. We've recorded a essentially a video course. We're calling them video chapter lessons where a lot of people don't want to read a book. Um, they want to actually watch the tutorials, especially when it comes to photography stuff. So even though the book is this beautiful, you know, hard cover, I'm going to knock on it and it's full, full color inside the book. There's 125 pictures inside of it, but some people just want to watch step-by-step -step tutorials. So that's why we made video lessons to accompany each chapter so that like people could watch step-by-step -step over my shoulder for some of the more visual lessons in the course. And anyone who buys the book gets that for free. And there's a link inside the book where you can get that course. That's great. And like you say in the book, this is for anybody who's looking to make photography a full-time profession or if you just want to do it as a hobby. This book is for anyone who wants to pursue photography, whether for passion or profit, um, it, regardless of whether or not they want to shoot just for fun or for the therapy of it, or if they want to make a part-time or full-time living. I teach you all of that in the book. And the you know making money part is optional. That's the fifth and final part of the book. The book is broken up into five parts. The first four parts are really for anyone interested in photography, including people who like iPhone photography. Chapters three, four, and five are written with really practical examples and you know step-by-step -step stuff where it's like here's a before photo don't do this here's an after photo here's how here's how you can tell a better story and use this trick uh chapter five is entitled rookie mistakes and magic tricks and anyone in the world can use a smartphone or any type of camera and read that chapter and become a better photographer david thanks so much this was great man thank you so much for having me this was a blast and as always, guys, thanks to you for listening to Booked on Rock. I'm Eric Senich. Look forward to having you back again for another brand new episode coming soon. That's it. It's in the books.